my name is Elizabeth Rasekwala and uh, in my day job I'm a chemical engineer in the oil and gas industry. Uh, but I also for my sins, you know, work in areas like science, communication, uh, gender and science and uh, social inclusion. Because for me it's really important that um, science actually evolves to a place where it benefits all of society uh, and women are part of that and different social cultural groups are, around the world are part of that and social inclusion should be a part of what science is about so those are, that's really uh, the mixed bag of what i do and uh, that's why i'm here science doesn't have all the answers religion doesn't have all the answers either traditional knowledge doesn't have all the answers but if we can find a way of bringing them together in a win-win situation where there's learning and sharing and giving and taking on all sides, then I think we can find our way to a, to a real brave new world um, that would work for rich and poor men and women. And that's critical, yeah. What, uh, what for instance, could science give up in order to bring the situation to win-win? I think science needs to give up three things. It needs to give up its male dominance, um, and, and that male dominance is global. Uh, there is nowhere in the world that is free of this male dominance in terms of science. Everywhere in the world, science is still seen um, as a male thing. You talk to young children from any corner of the world, their image of a scientist, it's a male. Are you with me? Whether it's white, brown, green, it's male. They don't think of female. So the male dominance of science needs to be addressed. Um, the second thing that science needs to give up, it needs to give up its Eurocentric dominance. There is this concept that science is, pardon the phrase, it's the white man's thing, you know, it's the white man's knowledge only, it's the white man's gift to the world. But that's a big lie, because what we know as modern science today has been grown and developed by the knowledge from all parts of the world. The knowledge, the scientific knowledge of the Greeks came from the Arabic world. The scientific knowledge of the Arabic world came through trade with Sub-Saharan Africa. If you look at the history of science, every part of the world has contributed to what we know today as science. So this narrative of Eurocentric dominance and Eurocentric hegemony in science really has to be knocked on its head. And until we do that, we're never gonna get the win-win. And I think science needs to have a broader and inclusive narrative that says this is what the Arabic world so when people talk in today's terms about Muslims and you see Islamophobia, I find that really sad because many of the inventions we have in science today came from that same Islamic world. Yeah, the, 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 the Islamic world invented algebra, invented the number systems that we have today. So how does that square with Islamophobia being and uh, this notion of Islam being non-science? You know, that's a false narrative. So I think when we look at different parts of the world, we've, if we can turn it around, can you imagine how empowering that would be for a young Muslim child to hear that other narrative, are you with me, about Islam? We don't talk about that. We talk about the negative things. Um, and that's not helpful. So the third thing that science needs to give up the first one, as I thought, was the, the male dominance, the Eurocentric hegemony. The third thing that science needs to give up is the sense that it is the only answer to the problems of the world. Some of our problems are beyond science. Some of them are part of the mysteries. Science can never have all the answers. There are some things that will always be beyond us. Are you with me? Yeah. We'll never know what's out there in the universe. We might, I don't know who, who's prepared to go to Mars. I don't know. Uh, who wants to go to a black hole knowing you're never going to come back? You know what I mean? So I think science also has to accept that there are some limits to questions that, yeah, that science cannot answer. And, and that in fact, yeah, um, if we answer them, then we have no reason to, for being. So it's actually good that we still haven't got the answers. And we keep asking. So I think those are, the, for me, it would be the three things that science has to give up for us to have this win-win world. Yes.
Thank you. And what do you think will be inspirational for a young generation to engage with science? Because now there is a trend of declining of interest in STEM education among teenagers and especially among girls. I think it's these three things that we talked about. I think because the image and the narrative of science is so alienating to young people because they see this male dominance, that we live in a global world, they see this Eurocentric dominance that doesn't actually give narratives about what their cultures have contributed. Are you with me? Uh, to science. Imagine what it would mean for a young Indian girl to know that, you know, part of the, the, the growth of science came from, you know, parts of northern in, in India that were under what was the Persian Empire, you know, the num enumeration systems, irrigation systems that were developed by the Persians, what is now Iran. I mean, if you go back into the whole history, are you with me, of all the different regions of the, in the world. but. Do we tell that to young Indian children? No, we tell them what, science is the white man's knowledge. The white man knows it all. It only belongs to the, the, the European, you know what I mean? And that's the narrative. So how can you inspire and enroll? Are you with me? Yeah, uh, young people. So I think that's important. Um, and I think in terms of the gender paradigm as well. Uh, and I think it's important for the visuals. Like I said, it's important for young children, for black girls all over the world, to know that a chemical engineer looks like this. Because their image of an engineer is a white man in a greasy overall. You know, with dandruff, smelly, horrible looking. Not the kind of guy you even want to have as a boyfriend. You know what I mean? what is an engineer, you know, so and you ask yourself, so why would this young girl want to get up of a morning and say, I want to be an engineer? So when we talk about role models, we need to give young people a diversity of role models, you know, even in terms of gender. Um, so that, that's the visuals, very important. Um, we live in a world of PR, of marketing. I mean, look how much money Coca-Cola spends on marketing. And yet we know what the Coca-Cola bottle looks like. I think science also could do with a, a marketing, a PR makeover, don't you think? Yeah, in terms of the visuals, in terms of how we show young people different visuals of what scientists and engineers look like. So it's actually selling yourselves, in fact. We actually have to sell ourselves, yeah. And I think, uh, like, uh, one of the, 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 the questions that was asked after I spoke, where he, uh, someone was talking about a Turkish guy that felt that he had to conform to a Western way of dressing to be taken seriously. I think, I think that's very sad. That, that points to that lack of inclusion. And, and I think in that process, he's actually denied a young Turkish person a chance of actually having a role model. Yeah, because it's a missed opportunity for a young Turkish boy or girl to say, ah, there's someone who wears my national dress and he's an engineer. I can be an engineer too. Are you with me? So when we actually um, compromise and we give up you know, our own cultural and traditional identities because we want to conform to the Eurocentric notion, um, we actually do more damage than good because we miss out on the opportunities to be role models for young people from across the world. So it's very important, yeah, that we have the courage of our convictions. That's what I say. We, 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 we talk the talk, but we don't always walk it. Yeah. Many of us say these things, but we don't have the courage to live and practice what we preach. Yeah. Not yet. Do, yeah. do you think... Do you think that the problem might be that, for instance, cultural details such as um, clothes or religion can be associated with wrong perception of, of, of for, for instance, the responsibility, speaking about the responsibility and uh, especially the knowledge the person can have? I totally agree with you and I think this is what makes people intimidated and therefore they conform. But what you should actually do is to use that opportunity to, to, to open up the narrative, to engage people, to educate people in a different sense of, of how the world looks. Are you with me? So th that's the responsibility that goes with actually challenging the visuals. Are you with me? And I think that's what we don't do enough, are you with me? So it's not just enough to, to come within that cultural visual. You also have to bring in a narrative 
that adds value, are you with me, to the conversation, that adds a different perspective, are you with me, to the conversation, or else it's another missed opportunity. But again, that takes courage, because people find it easier to say things that they think people want to hear. And it's a lot harder to say the things sometimes that people need to hear, but they don't want to hear. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's, that's, that's tough. Mm. How long do you think will it take to, to make such a conservative sphere of science open-minded? And take, like maybe making it globalized and uh, accepting all the different cultural aspects? How long may it take? I think it's it's gonna take us a while, but I think at least we're moving. <laughs> we're moving uh, in the right direction. Uh, unfortunately, I think that like most things, it's it, it's it's gonna. We, we seem to move when there's a crisis, when there's public crisis, public loss of confidence in science. Then things happen, you know, quickly. And I think, you know, I'm sorry to be cynical, but that seems to be the pattern. And I think we are now actually in, in a phase where, you know, there is there there is a certain level of crisis. There's a certain level of loss of confidence in science. And I think you're going to see a lot more movement in terms of that inclusive front. Um, Than, than maybe when there isn't a crisis. So sometimes things have to get very bad, <laughs> uh, you know, before they start to get better. And unfortunately, I think science is quite similar to other sectors. Yes. So when we when we when we're short of numbers, when we're short of people to do research, then suddenly you find government policy changes and everybody's rushing around and yes, we're gonna do inclusion, yes, we're gonna get the women in, you know. And you get all these old beards talking gender equality and you're like, excuse me, you were not saying that before, you know what I mean? But yeah, unfortunately that's what it takes uh, to change policy, to get things to move, yeah. Mm. What is a, a, your ideal world like? In what kind of world would you like to live? I, I don't believe in ideals. I, I think it's just a case of, uh, uh, a, you know, it's an evolution. I think the world needs to, you know, e you know evolve in, in different ways. And as long as we're going in, in the right direction, I think that's important. And, and I talk about the ev evolution of the lives of the women in my, in my family. Uh, my grandmother Uh, barely finished primary school um, before she was married. In those days, um, it wasn't the tradition to even educate girls. So she was even lucky she went up to uh, what they call standard six. And uh, in 30 years of marriage, she had 18 pregnancies. 18 pregnancies. I mean, she went through the whole heartbreak of every indicator on infant mortality from miscarriages to stillbirths to oh trauma you know she went she went through all that and and um, out of the 18 pregnancies only four my mother and my auntie and my two uncles uh, only four children made it to adulthood and Her body was absolutely broken. She, she didn't even make it to her early 60s. Um, that was how traumatized her experience was. Um, and that was what it was like for, for, for women in, those, in her generation, where the, the level of societal consciousness about where women's place in society, you know, early marriages, you know, You know, women just didn't have control of their lives. So that was my grandmother's generation. And then in my mother's generation, you, you got, you, things moved. You could, you know, you could be a nurse or you could be a teacher. That was about as far as you could go. But at least you were allowed to be, you know, educated, only, but only to a certain level. Uh, so my mom went into nursing and uh, worked her way up, uh, you know, to be a hospital matron. And um, she had seven pregnancies. Um, six of us made it into adulthood and uh, in my generation we're all scientists and 
PhD holders, we're all in different fields in engineering. My four sisters, um, my older sister is a professor in medical psychology at the teaching hospital. Uh, my immediate older sister is a medical doctor, she's a pediatrician. She runs her own children's hospital. I'm a chemical engineer and my younger sister is a biochemist. So in three generations you can see how the trajectory of women in my family have evolved. And, and that really for me is what it's about. It's about to see that progressive journey. I don't expect it all to happen overnight, but as long as that progression that has happened for the women in my family, that is what I want to see across the world for women. I want to see more women like myself being able to tell that story. And it's a very sad thing for me that there's not many women who are telling that sort of a story to say, my grandmother was here and this is where my mother was and this is where I am. And, but that's what needs to happen more across the world. We cannot, we need to see from each generation. And then in my children's generation, my daughter is an IT you know, expert. She can do all kinds of weird and wonderful things in the internet that I can't even speak of. But that's the progression. And uh, so my grandmother who barely educated, you know, had a, a very hard, you know, uh, um, um, life. Um, with all these pregnancies and not really being in control, you know, has grandchildren and great grandchildren in all spheres of science, lawyers, accountants, she could never even have dreamed of. But I'm sure somewhere up there, well done, Gran, you know, I'm sure somewhere up there she's like, go girls, you know, she's really cheering us on. And I think that that's a wonderful story. And I think that, that for me is, is what I want for every family. I want every family to have that evolution in a positive direction, yeah. That is amazing. <laughs> Can you also think of a, a story? You, see, you want uncle's story. Yes, you? yes, <laughs> very, very brightly <laughs> illustrating. <laughs> yeah, like please. Left for the table. Oh, yeah, okay, she wants me to tell uncle's story. Well, this happened, as I said, when I was a, a teenager in high school. And uh, my uncle had been married three times. This was like the third time now. And each time he hadn't had children. But when he divorced these, his, his ex-wives and they remarried, they had children. And it took him a while to clue on, you know, men being in denial, you know, that the fault is to do with me. And um, so after the, 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 the third marriage now, my grandmother, you know, being the, the family matriarch now, my, my uh, grandfather had passed away, decided that she was going to take my, because she wanted to have her grandchildren. This was on my father's side. She wasn't, my, my grandmother on my mother's side had passed away. Uh, so, yeah. And uh, she took matters in hand. And being of that generation, she was a firm believer in indigenous knowledge. So she wasn't going to have this nonsense of him going to the hospital and whatever. No, she took charge and says, we're taking him to the bush. And uh, so, yeah, he literally did go to the bush. You know, he was way out of, you know, in, 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 in the back end of nowhere. Um, and we didn't see him for a year. We heard that he was okay or whatever. So a year later, uncle comes out. And as I said, he is looking good. He's trim, you know, he's got a six pack where he used to have the big beer belly. He's got cheekbones, he's looking good. You know, he wears a belt now around the waist before the belt was down here. So anyway, he was looking good. And, uh, and to be honest, my uncle had always been a bit of a ladies man, you know what I mean? So now he was even more of a ladies man, he was fierce. So, and as I said, to, if we, to prove that it worked, within a year, he had these six women pregnant. And because he wasn't exactly a responsible man, um, he wasn't really doing his end of, of supporting the women. So they started complaining to the family that, um, yes, this your, your, your brother's got us pregnant and he's not helping to support. So, yeah, so we had to, it became a crisis and now Granny had to call a different family meeting to look at how we could support uh, my uncle with these children. So, but I think, as I said, in, in later years, uh, I actually talk to my granny to try and get a sense of what was actually done because like someone says how do you validate between indigenous knowledge and western knowledge and what was interesting for me um, 
by this time I had friends in the medical profession so I was asking them about what they would do what happened in this sort of fertility treatments and it was interesting that a lot of those things were the kind of things that uh, the traditional knowledge uh, did for my uncle. So, for example, about him losing weight, you know, there's a correlation between being overweight and it affects your sperm count. There were, the, he had psychological counseling, you know, to boost his confidence. He's, he was put on a special diet. There's all kinds of things that will help to boost your sperm counts. So, even though it was traditional knowledge, because it wasn't actually written, uh, it just goes to show you that they know a lot about, you know, those kind of things. And, and, and it worked, yeah. But it was very much along the lines uh, of what you would, uh, you would undergo in a normal uh, Western uh, fertility clinic, yeah. That's what uh, my uncle had, yeah. But uh, it's fascinating. Mm. That is amazing. Thank you very much for your interview. <laughs> Maybe one last quick advice, just just very, very quick for future science communicators. What mm -hmm. should they pay attention to? Just very brief. I think what they should pay attention to is, I think, the issue of impact. I think we haven't talked a lot about that. Uh, and impact for me means what are we doing it for, you know? Um, and be very clear, if you're doing it to write a research paper, fine. If you're doing it because you want to change people's lives, then you've got to be serious as to how you, you put together what you're doing. If you're doing it because you want to be a professor, <clears throat> that's fine. Uh, I, I, I'm not you know, one way or the other about your motivation, but I think you have to be very clear what your motivation is. And I think a lot of people go into science communication not being very clear what their motivation is. And then they wonder why they're all over the shop. Uh, in my case, I'm not looking for a job. I don't want to be a professor. I'm doing it because I think it's very important that we have an impact on people's lives, that people's lives are better. And I'm doing it because I believe that science does have something to contribute to the world. I really do. Um, I'm not just saying that because I'm an engineer. Science has something that it can bring to the table to make the world a better place. But the problem is how, 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 how. It's the how, how we engage with the world to make sure that what we bring of science actually uplifts the world rather than bringing the world down. And that, that's what needs to change, the how. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.